At this time, we'll release the kids for uh, children's church and children's activities outside this door here to your left. And in the meantime, if you would like to turn to your pew Bibles and stick a finger in page 543, we'll be doing Psalm 84 today. Lord, please bless our kids as they go. They are precious to you and precious to us. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. My name is James Holt. Poetry uh, is meant to bring uh, out an emotional response, and I wanted to read a few lines of poetry and see what kind of emotions come up within you, within us. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream, I there's the rub. For in this sleep of death, what dreams may come. William Shakespeare, Hamlet, circa 1600. Another one. It is truth, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of wealth. Opening lines of Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen, 1813. How about another one? Love arrives and in its train come ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet if we are bold, love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity in the flush of love's light, we dare be brave, and suddenly we see that love costs all we are and will ever be. Yet it is only love which sets us free. That's Maya Angelou from the uh, poem Touched by an Angel, 1995. One more, this is from a song, contemporary song. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. That's by Christian band, Mercy Me. I can only imagine, 1999. Now, I've been such a, a head guy all of my life, like my dad, that I might be the last person to teach anyone about matters of the heart but I am getting better with every passing decade. But when we fall in love, is it from the heart or is it from the mind? And when we long for God, is it from the heart or is it from the mind? The Old Testament is almost half poetry, the other half being prose. And poetry in the Bible, like any poetry, is meant to stir the heart. A relationship with God, like any relationship, bonds primarily from the heart and not the intellect. If it was from the intellect, I would have it made. But as it is, I struggle connecting with God from the heart, and perhaps you do as well. Now, the book of Psalms, being all poetry and meant to be put to music, every last one of them, remind us that our faith experience is very much a heart matter. God longs to be in relationship with us and to meet us at that level. And so listen for and feel the emotion in Psalm 84 
as I read, feel free to follow along in your pew Bible, page 543, Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, or she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Selah. Happy are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold for those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Let's take a moment to pray. Oh, Father, I pray that you would use my lips and my heart to expound upon your precious word that I might do it accurately. Open our ears, open our hearts to what you would have to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. There are 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms and they are of different types. So for example, there are hymns of praise lament, thanksgiving, to name the most common three. Psalm 84 is a hymn of praise or a song of joy, in this case, of who God is. From the subtitle, we see this psalm is attributed to or composed by the descendants of Korah, the Korahites. Now, this forefather is quite curious because actually in the days of the Exodus, roughly half a millennium before this Psalm, during the Exodus, Korah and several others rebelled against the authority of Moses. And when you rebel against the authority of Moses, you rebel against the authority of God. And God made the earth split open and swallow Korah and his household. Now, despite this rebel forefather, God in his grace allowed the descendants of Korah to serve him as gatekeepers and musicians. Now, just a word about the structure of Psalm 84. It is made up of 12 verses, and you'll see that it's subdivided into three fairly equal sections or strophes. And so a strophe, in this case, is made up of uh, four verses or stanzas separated by this term selah, which is some kind of pause or interlude. Now, the first strophe, the first Four verses is as if the psalmist is away from God's tabernacle or temple and thus away from God himself and he longs to return. And the second strophe, the middle four verses, is as if the psalmist is on pilgrimage towards the temple in Jerusalem and looking forward to being reunited with God. And the final section or strophe is as if the psalmist has arrived to the temple and is extolling his confidence in the Lord. Now let's take a, a brief look in these different sections a little bit more deeply. Strophe one has the psalmist distant from God's dwelling and yearning to return. So let me read verses one and two. How lovely is your dwelling place, your temple, or, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh. Sing for joy to the living God. Now here the psalmist longs for the dwelling place and courts of the Lord because in the Old Testament, the presence of God was often associated with a specific holy place such as a mountain or the temple or as during the Exodus in the cloud and fire. 
But what he's really getting at is he desires God himself. And this is made quite clear at the end of verse 2, where his whole being, his heart and flesh, sing songs of joy to the living God. And here, this is the most important descriptor of God in the entire psalm, that he is the living God. Not a force, not an abstract idea, but a person. And what's the best way to have a relationship with a person? From the heart. Continuing on, verses 3 and 4, even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Now, we have swallows in El Paso, don't we, making their mud nests along the walls and ceilings of some of the uh, areas exposed to uh, to the outdoors. And sometimes their nests, their mud nests, look like pottery or stacked pottery and have have a hole in them that birds fly in and out of. And we can imagine that the psalmist has seen such nests on the walls and ceilings of the temple and how fortunate that even these simplest of creatures gets to reside with the Lord. And just as a song naturally comes from these birds, so songs of praise arise in the Lord's people who dwell there. So moving on to the second strophe, the middle four verses, has the psalmist placing his strength in the Lord as he travels by foot the road to Zion. Now Zion is a hill upon which the temple of the Lord was built in Jerusalem. And we can imagine maybe a a pilgrimage, say from this church up to Trans Mountain Pass, by foot, kind of arduous, kind of dry, but in anticipation of the Lord's presence meeting us there. Reading verses five and six. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways or pilgrimages to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. Now there is no known location for this valley of Baca. But in Hebrew, Baca means weeping. And the image here is that this is a dry and desolate place, which describes the desert wilderness on the eastern approach to Jerusalem. And that desert is even more severe than ours. The image is that people who are true to God, even in a desolate place, bring lush, and vibrancy by their presence. They gain strength along the way despite the wearying journey. Verses seven and eight, they go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Moving on to strophe three, the psalmist has arrived at the house of the Lord and confidently places his trust in God's provision and protection. Verse nine, behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. And here the psalmist asks God to keep watch over Israel's earthly king, the anointed, who also resides in Jerusalem and who is represented by this image of shield. But the earthly king knows that his real strength is from the Lord. Verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. There's more to be gained in one day with the Lord than a thousand supplied by any other means. And the Lord's presence, even for just one day, is what's satisfying. The image of doorkeeper is intended to be a humble position at the fringes of the activity going on in the temple, as if to say that even this modest function in God's presence far exceeds any privileged position that the world may offer with its false security and false promises. 
Verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold for those who walk uprightly. And here's why a place with the Lord is far superior, because the God, the, the maker of the entire universe, maker of heaven and earth, the seen and the unseen, he is the psalmist's provider and protector. He bestows favor and honor. He lavishes good things from his endless storehouse for those who seek God's ways. No human or institution can touch this. And finally, in verse 12, O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. The psalmist ends his song of praise with a blessing, a, a benediction for those who choose to put their trust in the Lord. So we see in this hymn of praise that the psalmist both worships God for who he is, but he also reinforces his own confidence and commitment in trusting God and walking in God's ways. And so I'd like to suggest three applications that we can apply Psalm 84 to our lives in three ways. And I'm, and I'm using the same three-part structure, these three strophes, uh, as a way to structure these applications. So application number one, to what is your heart drawn? To whom or to what have you given your heart? Sometimes we don't reflect on this question much, but the right answer is the honest one. You see, the things of this world will not satisfy our deepest needs. The quest for money, the perfect job, the need to be liked, getting attention or even fame, sexual encounters, a large retirement nest egg, job security, a spouse that supposedly will provide all of our needs, a political leader, a social movement or some idea that the government will be our provider and protector. If any of these have captured our hearts above God, they will only leave us empty and anxious because they cannot fill what only God can fill. Fulfillment and security are found in the Lord alone. And he made us that way. This is not to say that there won't be challenges in this life, but it does mean that we want God to be present through them and to direct us through those challenges. Application number two is nurture a yearning for God from the heart more than the intellect. We don't adore facts, we adore a person. Now the pursuit of God can at times feel like an arduous pilgrimage. It does not come easy, nor is it supposed to. A good love story overcomes long odds. There are many distractions and temptations calling out for our attention and our loyalty, but like any relationship, especially a deep love relationship, you have to fight for it. You make intentional choices and at times make sacrifices to declare how much you really love God. And finally, application number three is establish a right view of who God is. The more we know about God, the more we will love him. For his character is flawless. He is endlessly patient and forgiving. And he guards our best interests. Reading the Psalms is excellent in getting to know God. We humans are God's prized possessions and he loves us dearly. His promise is that we will, he will withhold no good thing from those who love him and honestly seek him. St. Augustine was a famous church father living in the fourth century, and he said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. What are you longing for? Satisfy that longing in God alone and you will see with the psalmist that better is one day in God's courts than a thousand elsewhere. Amen. Let's pray. 
Father, we release our grip on the things of this world that we might receive your blessings instead. For you are our provider and protector. We yearn for more of you in our lives. Lord, forgive us when we stray and we clutch on to lesser things for your ways are best. You are perfect. You love us deeply. We long for the good things that you have for us from your storehouse. We love you, O Lord. And let's pray the Lord's Prayer together, please. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.